Hello. Today we will talk about a little bit about um, toxins, basically. And what you're seeing on the screen is basically your molecular structure of your diphtheria toxin. Um, my lecture is based on this uh, uh, great book uh, called The Mechaniz Me Mechanisms of Microbial Diseases. So at first we'll talk a little bit about, in general, how um, how some of the mechanisms that damage the host during infections in general, and uh, going into uh, talking about specific toxins, uh, what they're made up of, what their characteristics are, and later uh, more specific toxins that we would encounter um, in our uh, inpatient services and some future antibiotic endeavors. So. Um, basically, what happens during an infection, this is not specifically to toxin, but it just in general with when our uh, bodies and our hosts uh, encounter a uh, micro, uh, microbe. So there is lysis of cells, there's altered metabolism, mechanical damage, and some host responses that uh, really damage the uh, host body. So initially, so in cell death, so for example, like in uh, Clostridium species, uh, they end up lysing the RBCs through their um, exoenzymes and the toxins released by them. And in effect, they create this very anaerobic milieu for the bacteria to thrive. And some of these uh, enzymes that are released are very membrane damaging, and it's, it's not specific to, um, to a specific cell type or uh, tissue. Cell death also from lysis from the inside. So for example, in Rocky Mountain spotted fever, the endothelial cells are damaged by the intracellular growth of rickettsial organisms. And also at the same time, some of these um, uh, cells in the endothelium are, are killed by your cytotoxic lymphocytes. And that is what's in, in theory uh, uh, that gives you the rash as you see in here. And again, our basic cell mediated immune responses where the infected cells um, stimulate your immune response via your uh, memory and t, uh, t helper cells, release of cytokines, and e eventual killing of, uh, of your cells. Apoptosis, right, is a normal part of a mammalian cycle, cell cycle to maintain uh, healthy cells. In uh, Shigella and Salmonella infection, it is thought that they actually escape the apoptosis of macrophages, and that's why they are able to survive. Uh, in these cells. For HSV and HIV, they actually induce premature apoptosis, and in EBV, they block apoptosis, you know, leading the cell to uh, cancerous growth. Um, Alter metabolism seen in, let's say, cholera and some of other uh, enterotoxins, there is no direct killing, but it results to severe diseases. So um, the toxin that's produced in cholera results in massive movements of ions and water, and, and, and some of these um, uh, toxins resemble the action of hormones or other pharmacological um, effectors. Mechanical causes, let's say your uh, ascaris, ascariasis, and small intestine, when they um, are obviously multiplying in large numbers, they can obstruct the gut. And it is also thought that a single worm can, can obstruct your common bile duct and lead to uh, cholangitis and, and obstructive changes. And some of these obstructive changes, as we know, we've seen in filariasis that uh, stimulate tissue reactions in lymphatics that leads to swelling and tissue hypertrophy and ultimately leading to obstruction. So similar, a similar kind of sense leading to obstruction by a single organism, let's say your uh, liver fluke or the inflammation seen in epiglottitis or uh, prostatitis. Last but not the least are the host responses that that does a lot of damage to uh, as well in, in response to the to the infection. So there's always this interplay of inflammation and immune response and and uh, the overwhelming complement activation that's seen in sepsis, you know, that leads to a lot of uh, uh, damage. And, it, and in the picture is, a, is a, a picture of obviously brain swelling up in a, in a brain abscess. So going down to toxins, so when were toxins first really discovered? So it's, it was really in the early 1800s that um, some of the literature start describing uh, this putrid material that can possibly induce a fever and later down in the 
um, a few decades later in the early 1800s, really until the uh, 19th century, where they actually was able to correlate this putrescent material that could or originate from the bacteria. And this is the material that actually induces an inflammation. And later down, obviously, with, with, uh, with uh, improvement in technology, the discovery of um, pathogen-associated molecular compounds, and, and we know these, these com many different compounds are associated with many uh, bacterial components as well. So why talk about toxins, right? Still, um, this, you know, just in, in January and also, you know, in, in our clinical practice, we still do deal with a lot of patients that are suffering from these uh, toxins, you know, leading to limb loss and just overall sepsis, again, um, that is a global killer and it remains a life-threatening, you know, uh, um, disease and a, a global health priority deemed by the WHO. So we'll talk um, now about uh, some of the specific toxins. So first, exotoxins. Um, exotoxins are uh, toxins that are uh, released by the bacteria and they have generally they have a intracellular target. So um, and, in, and the basic structure is a there's a protein A, which is a catalytic um, or the enzymatic uh, domain and then and, and a protein B, which is the binding domain. So some of these uh, proteins or toxins are more specific to cell uh, to certain cell receptors. They can affect wide rate wide range of cells or tissues. And some bacteria uh, don't even any you know we know that that they don't really produce any toxin at all. So some of the characteristics and what some uh, exotoxins are. Uh, your super antigens, super antigens are exotoxins. They, um, I, I think it's a very appropriate name. We'll, we'll see why uh, later down the slides. They interact both with your antigen presenting cells and your T lymphocytes um, and, and leads to uh, production of and release of a lot of cytokines such as your uh, tumor ne uh, necrosis uh, alpha and your interferon gamma. Some exotoxins are pore forming. Uh, some are chemokines, they went in the sense that they recruit, recruit a lot of immune cells, and these are also dispensable. Um, that's why these, uh, the, the genes that encode for the exotoxins are, are located in your plasmids or sometimes in temperate bacteriophages, and also that ensures rapid spread. So, in, so thinking about this, so exotoxins for bacteria is really ambivalent. It is really not necessarily needed for growth, but at the same time, when used correctly for the bacteria, it is essential for survival and spread. So some top exotoxins are produced during stationary phase or uh, during spore formation, let's say in, in diphtheria, when there's um, in, in locally, when there's iron starvation, they start producing the toxin, which leads to a lot of cell death in the in that area. And and that cell death, you know, results to lysis and therefore release of iron to these uh, to the bacteria. So very, very, very smart mechanisms. So exotoxin, again, just focusing on, on our left side, um, your A is the catalytic or the enzymatic domain, B is the binding domain. So once it once that toxin binds to that receptor, it is internalized. And eventually the uh, with hydrolysis, the, uh, uh, the catalytic portion of the toxin is released into the cell and they have um, uh, subsequent uh, damage. So, a couple of examples of exotoxins. Um, it is generally the toxins that we talk about, you know, the toxins in anthrax, uh, bordetella, your botulism, tetanus, some of these um, toxins are all um, exotoxins. So, if you look down here at uh, Clostridium botulinum, the botulism uh, toxin, you know, in, in uh, it, it is a neurotoxin. So interestingly, this particular toxin will inhibit the synaptic vesicle fusion at the neuro, neurovascular junction, leading to flaccid paralysis. In contrast to our tetanus toxin, Clostridium tetany, which is also a same neurotoxin, 
but it, it but this toxin specifically um, has its target at the nerve terminals at the inhibitor uh, synapse, leading to more spastic uh, paralysis. So in essence, in both in tetanus and botulinum toxin, they lead to death from decreased ventilation of the host. Uh, and take a look at um, here at, in the middle, Carinibacterium diphtheriae. Uh, the diphtheria toxin, again, leading to cell death um, by inhibiting uh, host cell protein synthesis irreversibly and, again, killing the cells. And then down the row, we have some um, enterics, um, enteric toxins, Legionella. Uh, and then we will talk a little bit more specific about your Pseudomonas and our staph aureus and then um, super antigens and your strep. So how efficient are these toxins, right? Because you know some of these toxins can be uh, potentially and theoretically too uh, manufactured as a, a, bio a bioterrorism weapon. So they work in extraordinarily low concentration and they are known to be you know, among the strongest poison for humans. So in theory, they say, about one gram, or which is about this one fourth teaspoon equivalent of your tetanus toxin or botulinum um, toxin, or even shiga toxin, can, in theory, can kill 10 million people. And if if um, anybody, hopefully not, but you know, <laughs> if anybody's successful at manufacturing this amount, up to a pound of these toxins can you know wipe out the humankind. So we'll talk a little bit about type 3 uh, secretion system or your cytotoxin, which looks like a, basically like a straw. It's very fascinating um, organelle by the, <laughs> by the bacteria. So it is a, think of it as like a straw <laughs> by, the, by the bacteria. So they, and they are able to uh, directly secrete some of, uh, or um, some of the toxins or enzymes from the mi microbe to the host cell by contact-dependent mechanism. They're also called injectosome, uh, which in the sense that they are able to generate a pore uh, directly into the host cell. So likely they will not be in contact with any neutralizing antibodies. They won't be really um, uh, any, any antigens uh, to, to, to be exposed to your antigen-presenting cells. And these secretion system is thought to be present in our Yersinia species, Salmonella, Shigella, Pseudomonas, in cholera and in plague. And these are some targets for future uh, antivirulence drug discovery. We, we're not really, we don't really know much about it just yet, but in the future uh, we, we will. So if we look at the basic structure, just really quick, the injectosome looks very closely similar to uh, the flagellum of the bacteria. So um, we'll move on to, I'm sorry, not cell, cellular targets, but really next to um, your endotoxins. So your endotoxin is your LPS or your lipopolysaccharide layer of the outer membrane of our gram-negative bacteria. So in high concentration can lead to shock, sepsis, severe sepsis and death. It is actually a wrong etymology because endotoxins are not internalized, but they are actually present on the cell surface. So they are potent, potent pyrogens where they induce uh, the release of interleukin-1 and in, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha leading to uh, a lot of fevers and shock from your release of cytokines, the nitric acids and eicosanides, um, and ultimately also leading to DIC and deposition of some thrombi it could be severe in the kidneys, like again, but really in general in end organ areas leading to cortical necrosis. And what is Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome? So that is your basically infarction of your adrenal glands and leading to uh, adrenal insufficiency from the, uh, from the, that's resulted from the infection. So endotoxins in small amounts have uh, many, uh, target many different cells, so in copper cells in, in, in the liver that can increase in, again, those um, cytokines, in neutrophils leading to kinines and vasodilation, B lymphocytes, antibody production and complements and inflammation. 
Um, so, and in, in larger amounts, when the infection is not controlled, all of the above uh, effects plus shock and leading to um, DIC. There were actually ex um, experiments. Sorry, let me just close my door here real quick. Um, when, when LPS is actually injected to human uh, uh, experimentally, <laughs> um, it leads to a lot of, again, these kind of interplay of cytokine, release of cytokines that leads to your our clinical uh, manifestations of uh, decrease in mental status, fevers, hypotension, and shock, and uh, again, ultimately leading to death. So what are some of the membrane damaging toxins? So in general, they are like they are enzymes, right? They are, are lipases, um, or they act by inserting themselves in the membrane to form uh, pores. And in general, this is your, and, and some uh, more clinically relevant, this is our lecithinase uh, produced by C perfringens leading to gas gangrene. And what is so potent about this um, enzyme is that it, it lyses cell indiscriminately because it, its target is mainly your phos phosphatidylcholine, which is uh, present in, uh, in a lot of you know, basic, uh, mammalian cells. So by doing this, by, by uh, dam uh, damaging membranes, by lysing cells, they uh, are also potentially eliminating potential, potential host uh, defenses, at the same time creating this very great you know, necrotic and nutritionally rich environment for the anaerobes to thrive in that, in that milieu. And uh, pore forming toxins, uh, basically the mechanism is by inserting these pores to the membranes that leads to influx of water and then the cell swell and leading to lysis again. Um, when it's inserted in your macrophages, it inhibits the function of the uh, phagocytes by leaking potassium that is needed for protein synthesis. And it is essentially very similar to, to our uh, membrane attack complex and they are resistant to proteases and detergents. And some of the exa examples that are, that are poor forming toxins are the alpha toxin by Staph aureus and streptolysin O uh, by your streptococcus. So what specifically the streptolysin O binds to a cholesterol in cell membrane and it lyses, it's very interesting, it lyses the RBCs, but not your neutrophils or your macrophages. And it also acts preferentially on the membranes of lysosomes. And that's the one that in effect, the hydrolytic enzyme from the lysosomes that damage uh, white blood cells leading to apoptosis. Super antigens. So super antigens are your, uh, your toxic shock syndrome toxin and your staphylococcal enterotoxin serotype B and C. So as you can see here in, in the, um, the diagram, superantigen, again, can interact with your antigen-presenting cells, your uh, T lymphocytes, also in the sense that they also subvert normal antibody response of the host, so they are not targeted per se by the body or the antibody. And they lead to this stimulation of um, large amounts of antibodies, which is very wasteful and which is really not directed against the superantigen itself. And, and ultimately, it is uh, uh, the, uh, the antibodies that is produced is inefficient in combating the infection per se. And some toxins that are released to the extracellular matrix are called exoenzymes, and these are your high hyaluronidases, your deoxyribonucleases, which, which um, thins pus in gram positives, your streptokinase, um, which activates uh, plasminogen, leading to plasmin, and which attacks fibrin clots and eliminating, eliminating that fibrin barrier so for the bacteria to easily spread. And also, you know, some of these DNAs that are released from uh, uh, dead WBCs Make, make that milieu very viscous, so this, these enzymes are, are essential for, for spread. Okay, that was more of our kind of basic 
understanding of toxins. Let's talk about more specific toxins that we'll encounter. So first, your staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. It is a life-threatening disease, especially among neonates. The toxin involved here is your, again, exotoxin, which is a exfoliative toxin A and B, which is highly tissue specific uh, serine proteases, and they cause separation at the desmosome. Um, and this sign right here, clinically, when you uh, apply pressure to the skin and you see this kind of sloughing of the skin, this is called. Anybody? Nikolsky sign. Thank you, Nikolsky sign. Yes. And this uh, this uh, this clinical sign is it is um, present in not only in um, SSSS but also in your uh, your disease that targets or the, a disease that with the presence of your anti desmoglein one antibody. So right in your basically the des desmosome are like glues that 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 hold each cells together in your um, in your um, granular and spinous and basal cells. So the tar the toxin targets that area and at the same time this disease so in essence is very similar to your pemphigus vulgaris. So that Nikolsky uh, sign is also present in that. Uh, toxic shock syndrome is also a exotoxin or actually really this is your super antigen. Uh, manifested by uh, clinically with fever, skin rash, uh, hypotension, and dysfunction of several essential systems, organ systems, and ultimately peeling of the skin on, on recovery. Uh, most cases, if not all, uh, are related to uh, the menstrual cases with highly absorbent tampons. Um, and in theory, they say because the, when the tampon is, in, is inserted to a more anaerobic environment, you're actually introducing oxygen to that uh, to the uh, vaginal canal leading to uh, increase, um, uh, well, leading to thriving of your of your microbe that is not normally present there. But half of some, some of these other non menstrual cases have been related to arthroscopic knee surgery, and also necrotizing lung infection, especially with uh, MRSA, we have a case at Moffitt right now, a lady with severe MRSA, necrotizing pneumonia, and refractory shock. Um, so again, super antigen, your TSST, uh, toxic shock syndrome, toxin 1, uh, leads to uh, release of your interleukin 1, fever, uh, tumor necrosis um, factors, leading to hypotension, the rash, and and also, again, because it is a super antigen uh, preventing formation of protective neutralizing antibody. So, so, so we are, again, and, and the host are susceptible to even recurrent toxic shock syndrome. There is an entity called an extreme pyrexia syndrome that has been described in the literature. Uh, basically, a uh, two cases of of patients that have been um, infected with either MRSA or uh, MSSA strains, presenting with fever up to a greater than 108, and obviously uh, both all, all patients with this high uh, fever uh, passed away. And it just kind of tells us how the the, the exceptional uh, pyrogenicity that these toxins can induce. The enterotoxin. Uh, produced by your staff is interest. It is very heat stable. It resists proteases, and the toxin can even be still present and cause an, an an illness even in the absence of the organism. And again, it's it's also not necessarily destroyed by cooking because again, it is heat stable. Even even all your staph aureus, the organism themselves have have died. Um, and they, they affect specifically the vomit and control center of the brain and leading to intensive, uh, intensive intestinal peristalsis. Some streptococcal toxins, they are very similar to uh, uh, toxic shock syndrome toxins. They are, again, exotoxins, your super antigens leading to sepsis-like shock and multi-organ failure. 
And last but not the least, our pseudomonas. I don't think we, we, we talk about the toxin that's produced by pseudomonas a whole lot, but I think, again, in the future, we, we will have more information about the toxin that's produced from uh, our PSA. Uh, the, the exotoxin here by pseudomonas is very similar and, and, and in identical action to your diphtheria toxin. And remember, with their diphtheria toxin, they lead to direct cell killing by inhibiting protein syn synthesis in the whole cell irreversibly. Um, pseudomonas can also pr uh, produce extracellular proteases. And again, the type 3 secretion systems, your injectosomes, they are present um, in, in pseudomonas too, and which can have uh, many different effects and, and enzymatic activities. So what are some of our tools in combating the toxins, you know, as we know, they're they're not a whole lot so far, but hopefully more <laughs> in the future. So mainly, first is our clindamycin, right? It's it doesn't bind to toxin uh, as some of our, we were taught before, but it actually inhibits the uh, protein synthesis. So it, in a sense, inhibiting the production of your toxins. Uh, it, it binds to your 50 50s ribosomal subunit. And also a similar action also in your chloramphenicol and, and macrolides. Um, so clindamycin does inhibit production of the staphylococcal toxin. But in contrast, when we look at beta-lactams, the beta-lactams, it can actually strongly induce the production of staphylococcal toxin. And, uh, and fluoroquinolones can partially induce expression as well. So when we're dealing with patients with um, when, where we're worried about toxin production, it's probably not good to use uh, these um, antibiotics as opposed to your um, uh, other staphylococcal antibiotics. And because also there have been um, uh, instances where because of the induction of the toxin production, there, there are worse outcomes in patients with especially MRSA that are treated with beta-lactam. And also in gram negative organisms are intrinsically resistant due to poor permeability of the cellular outer envelopes. We can't use clindamycin in those, in those cases. The nasolid is our another um, anti protein synthesis, anti toxin production uh, agent, also bind to 50S ribosomal subunit. It is bacteriostatic for enterococci and staphylococci. But also, but uh, cytal in most strain, uh, most strains of streptococci. There was an interesting article here in uh, CID back in 2006 where they reported a successful uh, ca uh, uh, case of uh, uh, treating uh, staphylo staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome with linazolid alone. Um, the case was about uh, of a 56-year-old veteran who presented in December with, and he had underlying diabetes and he had some abdominal, um, he underwent abdominal surgery for, for to remove some shrapnel that he, that he had back in uh, when he was in the uh, Vietnam War. And about uh, a week uh, afterwards, he was given some augmentin for some wound, uh, post-surgical wound infection. And he presented with very classical um, toxic shock syndrome with with some rash and uh, and uh, a lot of fever and uh, and shock picture. So interestingly, what they did was they were able to grow the bacteria and, and ultimately from the wound it, uh, it grew um, MSSA. But if you look at the top here, uh, they they grew the bacteria with uh, with the addition of with the introduction of different agents and and looking at what the bacterial concentration is uh, versus the production of your TSST1 at the bottom. So what they notice is with the circle, which is uh, empty circle, which is vancomycin on the top, you see the bacterial still growth, very similar to no treatment. But if you look at nafcillin, clindamycin, and linazolid, there, there is that kind of decrease in that bacterial concentration. But I think what, what was more interesting is at the at the bottom graph, um, what's been really more effective in decreasing your concentration of TSST1 is your clindamycin and linazolid. 
as opposed to your, uh, no, uh, obviously, no treatment and vancomycin. So initially, th this patient, because he, ha he did have some um, uh, risk factors for MRSA infection, he was initially placed on the lazulate. And after um, suscept susceptibility testing and detesting, uh, they did find it was susceptible to clindamycin, and he was switched over to clindamycin, and he, he improved uh, dramatically. So we talked about clindamycin, we talked about linazolid. Lastly, um, IVIG, um, there isn't really a substantive uh, clinical data to, to recommend or to suggest actual benefit in staphylococcal um, TSS, um, and potentially there's more, uh, more a adverse effects. Um, they have been, it has been used in uh, some cases of severe staphylococcal uh, TSS who are unresponsive to other therapeutic uh, measures. And there have been some reports of reduction in fatality rates uh, for streptococcal toxic shock syndrome. So immune protection, the use of toxoids, your tet uh, tetanus and diphtheria toxoids, these are chemically inactivated toxins. Uh, in which they, um, when once injected to the to um, to the host, they mount an immune response, and in theory, it should maintain your immunity to uh, to natural infections. Uh, and you, you, we wouldn't really see this uh, more serious clinical symptoms. Um, passive immunization is achieved by uh, uh, antitoxins by horses and other animals. Um, it must be rapidly administered, um, and the side effect is uh, serum sickness. So I think the toxoid and to antitoxin uh, production or the, the science to develop behind it is, is very difficult and challenging because some of these toxins, once they are released from the bacteria or once they are introduced to the whole cell, they are rapidly internalized. And, and, and making it making them basically unavailable to antibody molecules, the formation of antibody molecules and you know also such as your uh, super antigens. There are several um, agents or future antibiotics um, that is targeted against the type 3 secretion system. Remember that again injectisome with your pseudomonas, shigella, salmonella, um, some uh, experimental molecules and some even old um, uh, non-antibiotic molecules, you know, here in the middle, meprazole being used for uh, salmonella. So it's trying to see some of these um, agents that could be used for specifically targeting your type 3 uh, secretion system. But I guess we'll, it'll take some time for uh, for uh, actual seeing the benefit clinically in the uh, hopefully in the near future. Any questions?